Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, Greg Hall here, CEO of Alligator Energy. I uh, want to talk to you about a group and its advanced work in the Samphai Uranium Project, our in-situ recovery project that's under development, along with our uranium exploration in the Northern Territory and South Australia, and a little bit on the optionality of our nickel cobalt projects in Italy. We are expanding our team. We've recruited now a, a range of senior people. We're up to 25 or more in the company and, uh, and really putting some horsepower on at the ground, uh, in particular at our Sanford project. So I look forward to the chat. Greg, good to have you back. Um, I think you spoke with Marilyn back in April, a little bit more technical. We'll put a link below so people can go and have a look at that if they want to get, get into the weeds there. Look, you, you're right. You're, you, you, you talked to, talk to the game of getting into production. Um, you need to be set up for that. You need to be set up for, with, with regards to the corporate side of things. You need to be set up with, obviously, the right partners, marketing and otherwise. You need to set, set up with the capital. And those are the things I'd like to talk to you about um, today, if you don't mind, given the kind of portfolio context of what you've built so far. Um, give us the give us the Sanfar, um update. So how are things going there, first of all? Yeah, very good. We've been on the ground drilling again since February. This time... Uh, last year was about um, getting the team together. We got first drill rig on for a, a good period of time, but still not continuous. This year we got two rigs drilling constantly from February through to September, and and that's a, a focus to both infill, lift the quality of the resource to a large portion of indicated, and extend the resource as well on the main project. Do first touch exploration down to the south. Uh, but be ready for uh, gearing up for our field recovery trial, which we'll be constructing in the last quarter this year and operating through into the first quarter next year. And so we need our exploration or resource drilling team helping with that work. So that's the main task this year. Um, we have put some results out a few weeks ago, which showed we're getting those good results. But um, in terms of advancing it further, uh, the, the retention lease application for the field recovery trial is being assessed by the government now. And that's important because it is the first uh, full approval process for the trial and it, it's, a, it's a step on the way to the major approval for the project because you do all the same work underpinning that. Uh, so that's uh, being assessed now by the government. We've got uh, engagement going on there, which is important. And more than that, uh, myself and our marketing agent, uh, or Kevin Smith from Traxxas with them, we've been out talking to utilities. First start of those conversations uh, last year. And we're now on our third round of conversations. And, you know, there is, as you would have heard from others in our industry, there is a, a big interest in people saying, where is uranium coming from in four to five to six years? So that's why they're talking to groups like ours now. So... That project's doing, it's on track. It, it is going to take a bit of work. We've now got senior people employed in the right categories to take it forward and uh, and we're getting some runs on the ground. Great. Okay. So um, you are, what, 130, 140 million market cap, depending on the time of the day. Um, you have got a currently small project. So that kind of resource drilling, that continued drilling to increase, increase the resource is really, really important to you for all of those conversations with your marketing conversations specifically, but you also need it for, for funders, right? So um, how, how, are you, how are we doing for cash right now in terms of your ability to continue to drill and continue to kind of build out that resource? Yeah, we're still sitting on 20 million cash, right? So we've, we've got the, the, the project, the main sound project project's well funded for both the, the resource drilling of a few million and these field recovery trials in the order of six six to six and a half million so uh, that's going to run through to early next year so we, we're, we're well funded to take those projects forward along with our corporate support and a bit of exploration so we're not we're not in the means whereby we're going to be rushing out to the market uh, as you ask any board or any ceo are you going to raise money they said well we've got money to do what we need to do if the market's right if the opportunity's there we'll bring cash in but certainly we're well funded and we, we, we made sure we, we got the funds first, $30 million raised in 21, then we recruited the team in 22, and now we're on the ground doing the work. So that was really the flow that we wanted to make sure we have. Right, and if you get a sense of um, what you need to look like when you're going out and, and having these conversations with utilities, you know, with, with obviously Traxxas is helping with that, with that process, but what do they need to see to believe that you're one, going to be able to get into production and to be able to kind of produce you know, enough pounds for them to, to be interested in you? Because I, what I, it's quite interesting when you look at the marketplace, there's a lot of people talking about the ability to get into production. Not many people believe that all of them will get into production and, and certainly not anytime soon, certainly not out of North America, that, that that's for sure. So, you, the, I'm, I'm just intrigued by this sort of nature of the conversation with, with utilities, trying to work out 
who their friends are, who they can trust, who to continue having these conversations with. Because chatting and having or catch up um, on, on with people is one thing. Advancing meaningful discussions about contracts is another. So wh where, where do you kind of position yourself in all of that? We're very upfront and honest with the utilities about the time it will take. And we are honest about uh, the fact that with our size company, a starter project in ISR of £1.2 million a year is doable. It's been done in the past by companies our size. The third thing is we talk about our team. So, so my background in, in managing mine operations in marketing material, but also our Chief Operating Officer, Andrea Marshall smith who is a, one of the most senior managers at Heathgate for 15 years, who has credibly started ISR uranium projects and mines, discovered them, drilled them, designed well fields, taken them through to production. So she now has a team around her that are, are planning that work. We also talk about uh, land access. So we're in a, South Australia is a well-regulated state. They've approved five uranium mines, all of which have operated, all of them. Some have gone back, restarted again, but they've all operated. The next thing about South Australia is, uh, is the land access regime to do with pastoralists, Indigenous groups. So we have a full agreement, NTMA, Native Title Management Agreement, and the Indigenous people have already given us two clearances for work on the ground, and that's that's continuing. And the main Black Horse project, which is our, let's say, uh, targeting a 20, 25 million pound resource to run for a good period of 12 years, we have full land access there. We have a full agreement with the pastoralists, not only to do the exploration work, but to either require or lease the area we need for a future process plant and mining operation. So the prime reason we're focusing our shareholders' dollars on that particular part of our opportunity there is we have full unfettered access there based on both approvals by the government and financing. Okay, so they're the sort of things that, that can be a hindrance to a path going forward is you've got to have the horsepower in your team. You've got to have the land access. You've got to have the resource. And the next thing we're going to test is the technical work. So while we've done all sorts of um, bench scale testing, you really need to do for, for ISR, in-situ recovery, you need to do a, an in-situ test. And that's planned to start later this year. So we're funded for that. We're getting the approval to get on the ground and we're starting that work. Now, by positioning ourselves there, we, the, the utilities can understand that, okay, we know the steps we need to do. We're on the path to do those steps. We're funded for those steps. They like to hear, you know, Western jurisdiction, well-regulated state, familiar with uranium mining. The, the regional town we're next to, Wayala, is familiar with uranium mining. Uh, we've got full access on the land that we need to have. We, we don't need to negotiate anything else there. And uh, we have the, the standard government approvals, which have happened five times in this state, uh, for the same sort of mining. So... That, that, that's the, the honesty and the level of comfort. But in our presentation, and we, we go through this with them, we show a five-year time frame to get to commissioning production. So we're fairly realistic about that. Even in South Australia, with an, uh, where you've had those approvals, it's still a three-year approval process for a new uranium mine. Right, yeah. No, I, th I think it's um, easy, perhaps for outsiders, to conflate uh, Western Australia and, and Queensland's attitude to uranium mining. So South Australia and the Northern Territory have have got a well well established um, uh, regulation in in, in place. Uh, so is that um, just just in terms of um, again back sticking with this kind of market and marketing side of things things for you, um, you've obviously you're looking towards North America. Presumably, there's this kind of again geopolitical thing going on where I think. You know, China is a good trading partner with Australia, certainly on, on coal, iron ore, uh, and, and, and other things. Um, uranium is slightly different, though. It has it has this um, aura around it in the sense that um, it seems very much east, east versus west um, in the sense of you've got to pick a team. Do the Australians feel that? Do you feel that in terms of, you know, potential end bars and, and obviously some of these conversations which are, which are happening now? Yeah, look, <clears throat> that's definitely a fairly new outcome in our market uh, for the last, let's say, 12 to 18 months. Uh, and at the recent uh, World Nuclear Fuel Market uh, meeting in uh, Europe, um, it, this came to the fore even more. So China uh, and, and Russia and certain other countries are, are linking their potential supply to potential demand together. 
And you're seeing that now a big telling factor here was the US coming out and saying that they are recognising Australian production in many commodities as if it was US production. So you are now getting that sphere of uh, Western sphere, Eastern sphere, if you want to call it like that, which actually was around back in the early 90s, by the way, in the Iranian market, very strong. So it's a bit of repetition. However, the good thing about it for groups like ours and, and uh, which are advancing projects is in Europe and in the US, US, where you had a big percentage in the range of 30 to 40 percent or 25 to 40 percent of uh, material being bought was EUP, enriched uranium product, straight out of Russia. You've now got European utilities, and I heard this in meeting with some at uh, in this conference a few weeks ago, for the first time they're having to contemplate, hell, we might have to start buying uranium and conversion and enrichment and doing our own mix and match about how we get EUP because there is no EUP on the market. And the rumour going around was people who are trying to source EUP are not getting any spot bids. So in other words, it's a tight market for enriched uranium product. So that's now channeling down into the enrichment services, the conversion services, and you've seen the prices lift. And, and it's anticipated to flow into the uranium market, but it's already flowing because certain enrichers are purchasing uranium because they need to underpin their enrichment plant performance by trying to overfeed, and they are already purchasing to do that. So... So that dynamics, so the eastern western sphere is real now. Uh, China is going to take more uranium from Kazakhstan, that's obvious. And you will see western utilities now really trying to source. So all of a sudden, uh, two key utilities here, a very, very large one in the country next to me, plus a, uh, a couple of smaller ones are talking to uranium guys of our ilk, which would never have happened before. Never. Oh, it's interesting. And, and I want to, and I don't want to get too much into the macro here because what I'm interested in is what your thinking is, you know, how you navigate these choppy waters. Because the reason I ask about the kind of um, East versus West thing and the, the kind of geopolitical situation is because we've heard some combative language coming out of the US in terms of, you know, what monies will and will not be made available to groups who include China in part of their ecosystem, in any part of their ecosystem, right? We, we've seen that in rare earths, we've seen it in EVs, we've, you know, and we've definitely been talking about it over the past couple of years um, with, in our, on our weekly uranium show, where you as a company have got to decide how you get capital, where you get your capital from to get into production. You're going to have to raise the capex to get into production. If you think you're going to be leaning in towards the US, then obviously, I guess, US utilities will be the potentially the end bar. But if you're open to a non-anti-China uh, narrative, then you've got to be very, very sure that your financing won't be affected by that. Like, would you, so would you, would you agree? I'm sorry, I don't want to put words in your mouth. No, you are, you are, you are correct. So um, we are leaning uh, to, the, to financing the group through the traditional means of Australian funds, and we've already got a relationship with a range of them, um, through uh, potential, um, we have the opportunity for a bit of financing through offtake, and that's because we have an arrangement with Traxxas, not only for marketing, where they'll help us put our own contracts in place directly with utilities between us and them, but with the balance sheet Traxxas has, they're willing to put in some funding, especially during the stage of feasibility and leading up to financing. And, uh, and they would love to have some access to spot offtake uh, in return for that. So we've got that opportunity and we put that in place purposefully to create that funding opportunity at an early stage, whether it supports the main construction or pre-construction time, that's important for us because you don't want to be short of cash when you're getting to that point. The other opportunities that we are aware in the market, and we've either investigated or talked to people about, are royalty streams, and there's a keenness on certain companies to look at those options. Um, and, uh, and we have not only our existing shareholders, but the funds that I mentioned as well. Now, the key thing about working early with Traxxas and looking at some conditional contracts at an early stage, and an early stage for us would be likely next year during feasibility, You've completed your field recovery trial. Technically, you're, you're more comfortable or you know what you need to do in your feasibility. At that stage, um, Kevin and I are always, have already been talking to some, let's call them anchor funds, who are willing to do a conditional 
uh, initial contract. So you might put something like about 20% of your material under those conditional contracts, and that would help Traxxas more comfortably fund and, uh, and some other financing options that would come through to that. So the reason we're talking to funds already, uh, to utilities already is to try and line some of those up. There are at least three interested parties we're talking to, but I will let you know this. Any US utility we've talked to has made it quite clear that if all of a sudden we have, um, let's call it Chinese ownership of our group that's, that's up close to 50% or more, then um, they need an out clause for their contracts. So you're absolutely correct. There, you have to make a decision about how you finance, depending on the marketing sphere you're going to go into. Right. Okay. And thank you for clearing that up. I, I just think currently across the metals markets, it's been really important for people to understand the strategies that companies are going to be engaging with. But just, but just because you're a Western pro- developer producer doesn't necessarily mean you are obliged to you know feed into the west you've got the whole the whole market is available to you but you've got to make decisions now now you're in the lucky position you've got a bunch of cash you've got optionality at this uh, about the speed at which you spend this um you know 20 million bucks or so um which you know some companies are struggling with because they're kind of cash constrained so they've got to think about their strategy in terms of either hunkering down or de minimis spend on advancing well in quotes advancing the project you have got the choice of moving allocating it wherever you want moving at you know a, a, a meaningful pace or, or, or not but I'm, I'm sort of intrigued as to how, how do you define your strategy if i asked you a year ago or something i did uh you know what what's the strategy has that changed or has that had to evolve partially in, in response to, the, to what's going on in the market, or do you think because you raised money at the right time, you've had the luxury of you know, sticking with, with plan A? In terms of our corporate strategy, it's similar to what it was uh, set two to three years ago. We developed it probably two years ago in a solid way. Once we'd acquired Samfire, we had the initial path established. So we've, while we've done more detail and, and, and um, shareholders and investors will have seen the first time we put out a five-year plan was in March on the back of that scoping study. So we've never done a five-year plan before that. And we could only do that once we had the, the let's call it the, the, the study at the required ASX format, such that we could do that um, comfortably. Uh, but that plan is exactly how we've thought about it. Is, it. is it a year later than we had of hoped two years ago? Yes, it is. And that's because you get a reality. First of all, a few things you've got to focus on. Recruitment in Australia with ISR experienced or even uranium experienced people is very tough. It's taking at least twice as long as it would have two years ago, three years ago. The second is, as we came out of COVID, in particular 2022, just getting drilling rigs, getting a mobile camp last year was almost impossible for some of our exploration work. Uh, Other things, it's taken a while to get these fundamental um, resource drilling, exploration um, logistics back up in speed. So, as I said, Samfire last year was half drilling or part drilling, this year's full-time drilling. So that's taken a bit of time. So that, that's one of the, some of the reasons why we now have a five-year plan rather than what I would have hoped is a bit quicker. But I think that's the pace we will be, even if we push it, that's the pace it will be because there are certain constraints. Working with Indigenous groups to get the timing of a clearance that you need to do further drilling, that is then up to the Indigenous group and the anthropologists about that timing. You have to get enough notice and work, but it can take some time. The approvals process, if you get questions where you've got to go back, you can add months to that. Very easy. So while we've allowed for that where we can, we know you can have these delays. Do you work hard to try to make sure you prevent them? We have a great list of what-ifs and risks to timing that we go through and investigate and allow for. Um, the reason we wanted to start the feasibility in the second quarter next year was to allow to make sure we've got lots of time to get the technical questions answered this year and the first part of next year so we can sleep, slot straight into it. So we haven't got any delay to our feasibility at this stage. So, so we really are trying to be realistic in what it will take. Both Andrea and myself and two of our board members, uh, Peter McIntyre, who is ex- Extract, and now Fiona Nichols, who's ex-Rio, has worked both with Rossing and the ERA, We've all started uranium mines, and so we know they, um, there's jumps and hoops and other things that, that, that you've got to get through. And uh, 
well, I'm, you can tell I'm trying to be hesitant about talking about this. I, we have a path. I, I know it's realistic. I know what can delay it. It's hard to determine what can speed it up. I mean, all of a sudden, the market took a run. Uranium price went to 80 bucks. We raised 50 million on the market. And could we speed a few things up? Possibly. But, but it's, it's going to take what it's going to take. The other thing is we want to see the market genuinely reflect the changes that are going on in EUP enrichment and things. I, we are unaware of a base price escalated contract that's been signed at $60 plus yet. And that is the area that we would be looking for. So let's let the market move to where the market's got to move. We don't have to rush in and sell our in situ resource cheaply. Yeah, I mean, definitely in terms of the market, it, it, you know, I was having this, the same conversations in 2019, and I think people will argue the case. I, you know, I, I, I wasn't wrong then, I'm just not right yet. Um, but yet it feels more and more tightly coiled in terms of the opportunity in front of us, and obviously the, the very, you know, supply demand fundamentals improve every day. So it's all good news. Um, but with regards to the, you know, I like what you're saying because there's a slightly more realistic approach to this. And we've seen this at various, I've just come back from Quebec and uh, also down in Barcelona, rare arts company. I was interested in the companies that talk about how you go about building projects rather than promoting projects. And um, th there's, there's a new economic reality out there. You talk about some things taking twice as long, not necessarily twice as expensive, but definitely twice as long. And, and, that, and that's time something you can't quite con control. I guess maybe the economics you know, d don't improve with time necessarily, but the, the, it's, it's not terminal. But um, for, for you, and, and the, you, you've mentioned the team a few times in this call, the ability to build versus just the pure ability to promote, and by the way, and I do that in the context of your PowerPoint is from 1920, is from 2022, um, is that's what's important to you. Get focused on bringing this thing to production and putting things in place that will allow it to actually get in, into production. That, that that seems to be what I'm getting out of this this conversation and some and what you're saying about your conversations with utilities and, and others. Oh, yeah, because they will remember. You, you, you start a relationship with nuclear utilities with your first meetings, which we did last year, and then you keep that going. They will remember what you said three years ago. So um, <laughs> you can't change the story. you really got to have some consistency about it. And like, any, like an investor, like a shareholder, like a government, like a, a customer, uh, if you do what you say you're going to do, that is the credibility that will get you where you want to go. So at the moment, um, while we've been slower than we wanted to be to get to even this stage, just because of recruitment and all the things I talked about, um, we still want to do what we say we're going to do. And that's the, that's the main aim. That's the credibility that will we'll take you forward. Our, our market cap is our market cap. The market's the arbiter of where it sees you're doing. If, if, you doing. Know, I, I do get comments to say, Greg, you're not out there talking enough about what you're doing and how you're doing it. Up until we had the scoping study out, I couldn't even talk forward-looking statements. So that scoping study, the resource that went with it was important. We're going to, we're drilling this year, we're doing infill, we put results out. We're confident we're going to get a lift up in the indicator resource this year, which will mean we can improve that production schedule in that scoping study. And in parallel to that, we'll put an updated scoping study out. And I'm sure we're going to have better economics from that just because of that, because we size the main components in this scoping study for a larger size plant. So but we'll, we'll do it. Let's just get it done by the third quarter to fourth quarter this year and have that out there. And that will show people that, well, okay, now they've got this many pounds. Now they've got 1.2 million ton a, pound a year. Now they've got this. So, so that, that's our main aim is to, to make sure we're on that path. In terms of spreading the dollars into other things, we, we, are, we do that carefully. We won't talk about that yet, but, but we are making sure the main game is focused on sound. Okay, fine. And Alex, I, I, we will put the link below to the conversation last time out. I think you, you covered a few of those points in a bit more detail. Definitely worth listening to. I, I certainly enjoyed it. Um, let's come back to kind of the portfolio components here, which you do have. So far as the focus, you've got other Aussie uranium projects um, in there as well, um, which we sort of covered off again last time. But talk to me about Piedmont, because I, th I think you're in Europe at the moment. Um, at the moment you've got a few, a few meetings that you've been having and, and, and will continue to have. So Piedmont, obviously that's nickel, copper, 
Uh, yeah, nickel, cobalt, ex- copper, gold, nickel, cobalt, copper, a lot copper. going on there. Mm. It, expiration, right? So it, it's early days and not necessarily ready for, ready for flipping out. But if things um, you know work for you on that front, it's it's, it's slightly incongruous to the rest of the por- you know uranium portfolio. So just going to remind me what the kind of the thought process is there for developing that. So we picked up Per Monte, the Piedmont project in um, 2018. When uranium was in the doldrums, we were looking for a broader spectrum of opportunity. We were looking at some energy-related minerals in Australia, uh, elsewhere. This was brought to us by known geologists. So we had a look and said, yeah, look, geologically, very interesting area, up thrust to the crust over the top of the Alps. This is where all the nickel projects are. 17 showings of greater than 0.5% nickel engaged, a very experienced nickel consultant out of Canada to look and said, look, I you know, didn't even, I, I'd heard about this, didn't know it existed. It's very interesting, uh, very early stage, etc. So we had made it clear right from that time that um, as uranium picked up, then Piedmont would be more a project we see value from. We want to see our shareholders have value, but it might be more valuable in with others, uh, like with a joint venture partner or someone working with us on it. So we've had CAs in place with a range of groups for about three or four years. Unfortunately, that area to the North Milan where this project is got impacted by COVID very strongly, couldn't get on the ground. But our process was this. We did initial ground truthing, said genuinely there are good examples, but there's not one drill hole anywhere through these old underground adits and structures and things. Then as we started to get, we got drilling permits just as COVID hit, couldn't get on the ground. And then in talking to one of our potential partners, they said, look, what we'd really like to see is some good geophysics. Let's have a look deeper at what might be there because the small adits in the hillsides are not going to cut it. Something bigger might cut it. So we did a ground, finally got on the ground for a ground EM survey last year, and we've got those results. We've got, we, we put out an announcement to show where we've got some key interesting plates uh, that we're trying to, to investigate. We've had a team over there in June, late May, early June, doing right over that area, taking more samples and doing some groundwork. We're waiting on assays for that now. Now, ultimately, we, we've got to, to reaffirm the tenements going forward, which is one of the reasons I'm over here doing that. But ultimately, we will have drilling permits that we might be able to drill, uh, but we'd prefer to have a partner come in and look at this with us and, uh, and, and evaluate it because uh, it's not our main game, but it is a very interesting game. And, and in light of the fact that you would hear this constantly in, in Europe, the European Union is really trying to encourage countries to get homegrown minerals. The minerals needed for the future industries, where are they? Here's one of the most significant potential nickel regions in Europe, and there's very little work being done on it. Not one drill hole in this whole area. So we're looking for partners who are interested in this. And... Um, we are happy to take it forward at a certain manner, but we'll do it slow. It's not a prime game for us. But if there's a, f- a company that's got some assets, they're interested in this asset, we could come in with them or they could come in with us or we IPO it or we get a more significant nickel cobalt industry partner says, well, let's put a bit of money in and see what it shows. Okay. So from that perspective, uh, we've got a good foothold. We've got good knowledge in both consulting geologists and our own geologists of the area, and we're willing to take it forward, but uh, I'm not going to throw lots of dollars at it. Not at this stage. It, 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 I, I'm, I'm, well, I'll be interested to see how that advances, because, I mean, some of the grades that you've been showing there across the board for, for you know, the nickel and the, and the certainly the copper um, and the gold is, is pretty impressive. Um, but, yeah, like I say, a lot more work to, to happen. Um, well, look, look Greg, um, sorry, sorry, it's a slight segue there, but I, I just no, wanted no. To, to, to address it. Um, uranium, obviously, market looking quite interesting. Price up around, I think, end of last week, 57 bucks. It's got a long ways to go, but um, I think the general mood is, is quite positive, isn't it? Uh, most certainly. The, the, the feel from the conferences is the what I'm, what's impressed me is the supply discipline. You've got both existing producers and producers just starting saying, look, a lot of people tell us you should be producing already. The, need, the market needs more. You should be doing it. And everyone says, we will produce and we'll put capital in when there are long-term contracts that underpin the return on capital and the shareholder return that we need. That's when we will produce. So we'll expand production on that basis or we'll restart production on that basis. And that's, and that's what you're seeing uh, is that supply discipline because um, many of us who have been in this industry have been caught before. Well, there's a rush up in price, let's produce. Whoops, something happens. You need to have that underpinning. So... That's what you're hearing from supply, from utilities, 
they want to understand the source of uranium going forward 10 to 20 years out. They need to understand it, they want to understand it, and that's why they're talking to all counterparties. They have nervousness in areas they didn't used to have, um, certain large Eastern European producers, and they have um, comfort that there's enough uranium in the ground, but how does it come out? So there's a mixed feeling in utilities about how this might work. But certainly the big focus at the moment is the enrichment conversion services tightness. How can, even if you've got uranium, how can you get it converted? How can you get it enriched? How can you create the EUP you need? So that is a real target focus right now for utilities. Uh, but certainly they're, they're thinking forward more than they were a few years ago. Greg, appreciate the update today. I'm glad it's going well. Um, look forward to more right, drill results and, and hopefully some moves in the market soon. Certainly, and we're um, just to finish, we, we actually have, um, we're quite pleased now with our progress at, uh, at Samfire. It took a while to get to this stage, but this year now we're moving much faster than we were, which is fantastic. We'll keep that moving because that's a prime focus. Great to have some expression on the ground in Arnhem Land again, which is, of course, the, traditionally the highest grade uranium in the country, uh, and some Greenfields work as well. But, uh, yeah, looking forward to the uh, year coming forward.